bless the Lord. We are here at the Prairie Center Church of God of Prophecy in Olathe, Kansas, October 7th. It's October already. The 2nd, isn't that 2nd? October the 2nd. The tooth. The tooth. Did I say the 7th? I meant to say the 2nd. I need to enunciate better. I think it's the microphone's fault. If we're going to blame anything, it's the microphone. It must be the microphone because, yeah, I haven't made a mistake yet this week. The, um, <laughs> thank you. That wasn't supposed to be funny, Betty. Uh, you, you were listening. Okay, well, good. Uh, God's judgment and the great flood. Uh, this, uh, we started, of course, last week talking about Noah and how Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and what was the evidence that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord was that the evidence in the, uh, the, uh, that was that he was obedient to God. He was, uh, had a relationship with God. Uh, and in spite of all the negativity that was around him, all the sinful the, uh, uh, activities that were going on around him, he was still uh, reliant on God for his um, uh, uh, sense of, of uh, uh, well-being. He was reliant on God for their, their relationship, and he was honoring God in what he did and how he raised his family and everything that he did. And so that was an important aspect of last week's lesson, that, that Noah was uh, righteous and Noah was uh, obedient to God. And when God said, build a boat, uh, he built the boat, and, and he built the ark the way God told him to. Uh, it took him a long time. There was a lot of preparation that had to be made, uh, that, the preparations that had to be made, and, and it was something that he had to learn, and God gave him wisdom, we have to believe, in the way, because he didn't get a second chance. You know, there was, there was one shot at building that boat right, and, and we have to believe that, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned I, in my mistake-free week uh, so far, that uh, uh, I've done lots of things the first time that I had to go back and redo because I didn't get it done right the first time. And, and if the whole survival of humanity and, and the animal kingdom was dependent on my being able to build a boat that size the first time, uh, it would have to be God's direction that, that helped him to do that. So uh, we, we, tr we understand that and trust in God. Uh, it's also important for us to know that this is not just a fable. This is not a myth um, or even a parable. You know, there's uh, many, the, the scriptures are full of parables when, um, you know, the, the Good Samaritan, for example, that was a, a, a parable that was not necessarily about a specific person, but, but was a story that told a lesson. Um, and some people will say, well, this flood story is just a, a parable or a myth that tells us a good story and tells us things. Um, the, the uniqueness about uh, or the, the way that we often tell the difference between a parable and an actual event are the details. You know, in a parable, it'll just say there was a certain man in a certain place uh, at a certain time, you know, not anything specific. It could be anybody, anywhere kind of a thing. It's just the, the idea is the principle of the story, not the details of the story. But when we talk about the story of Noah, there were very specific dates. There were ages. There were uh, places. Everything was very specific in when it happened, how it happened, and where it happened, even down to the size of the boat, you know, that, or the size of the ark. Uh, God had a plan. God detailed that, and it was followed, and, and that's how we understand and believe that it was an actual event. Um, you know, there, there are archaeological uh, evidences that, that we can look at that, that would uh, support this. You know, there's uh, all kinds of various geographic things and, and that, that word where they, they dig up fossils and things like that where, you know, the huge amounts of fossils that, that were uh, created in a cataclysmic event that, that would uh, mirror what the, the scriptures tell us happened in the flood. Some of, even the, the way some of the, the layers in some of the sedimentary rock that it's done in, in very distinct layers that happened at a precise time, not gradually over a period of time. Those types of things uh, could be in, interpreted as support for this type of a flood uh, process. So uh, we, we have both the, the scriptures, the word of God that, that uh, help us to believe it's true. We have some archaeological things that help us to believe it's true. And, and so we, we take this as 
um, as the gospel, even though it's in the Old Testament. Uh, but the, the, the other purpose is for us to understand that this reveals God's character to us. And, and you know, we always want to see how does this apply to us today? What does it mean to us? Yes, it was an interesting story. It's lots of fun to, to have kids draw pictures of the animals two by two and the little fancy arcs and things like that. Um, but what does it mean for us in our daily walk with God to, uh, now? And what does it mean for the future uh, in God's judgment uh, as, as we talk about the great flood? Uh, God is righteous, the subtitle says. God is righteous to stop evil doing by his judgment. And we're often concerned about the judgment of God and how he's, uh, you know, th there is an allowance for evil to continue right now. There's a, a period of, of, of mercy that God has given us to help uh, seek uh, him and to help guide people towards God and to evangelize the world. But there will be a time when his judgment will come, his mercy will end, and th there will be um, uh, the punishment for the evil p that people have continued in. And so uh, th 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 does that give us hope or dread th that we find that there's judgment coming? Um, you know, that, that's uh, an, an interesting point of view. We, we have a hope for ourselves, but we have some dread for others that we know that, that aren't serving God. And so the, the fact that judgment is coming should be uh, 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 a catalyst for us to, to, to remind us to share the gospel message with people around us. And that, that rather than just reacting negatively towards the evil that's around us, to use that as a, a reason for us to go out and spread the gospel message. So that's what's happening here in Genesis chapter 7. As we, we've seen Noah, uh, we know from the timeline that he spent 100 years or so building this ark. He and his family, his sons and their daughters, you know, throughout this time period. Um, and we can only imagine what the, the ridicule that they uh, uh, endured during that time. Uh, the, the, the fact that they're building something that's never been seen before for an event that's never been seen before. And, and people uh, didn't recognize that was going to happen and didn't believe that was going to happen. And so in verse uh, or, uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, and it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation of every clean beast thou shalt take of thy uh, by sevens the male and his female uh, we're talking about the beast uh, about the clean beast the clean beasts were those that were uh, offered and, and useful for for sacrifice for worship of God and so they, they brought those in seven pairs um, of those because they knew there were going to be sacrifices prior to them being able to reproduce. Um, it says the male and the female, it says in continuing in verse two, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of the fowls also of the air by sevens, male and female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Uh, so it, God is, uh, has a plan for his uh, reproduction of this world. Humanity is trying to do that as well. Did you know that? that there are, is a seed uh, repository where they are keeping seeds for all the various vegetables and all the various plants, and they keep them in these freezers, and they say, you know, if, if, a, if a, something cataclysmic happens to this earth, um, and, and, you know, a, an asteroid or a volcanoes or a flood or whatever, and everything's destroyed, we're going to have this little building that we're going to be able to, to go into and, and get these seeds, and we're going to be able to replenish the earth. Um, that's very uh, uh, optimistic, I think, in their point of view. I think if something that uh, catastrophic happens to this world, there nobody's going to know where that building is, and somebody will have lost the key and or or the password. You know, how, how are you going to remember the password that after all that's happened? But um, humanity tries to do that. God actually had a plan that was successful in, in doing this, and so they brought in the the, the animals, um, uh, male and female. Um, and of, of course, that's uh, th that is repeated frequently in here, and, and um, you know, in history, that may have not uh, been that important because uh, those were kind of assumed to be the case. And in our society today, as people are less and less certain about that concept of male and female, 
Um, I think it's important that we understand that God has a purpose for everything that he put in the scriptures. And when he created Adam and Eve and he called them man and wife and he said that is good and he described that, that bond, that, that he repeats this over and over and over again. And for us to be uh, contradictory of that is saying, God, you really don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you know, I, I and my feelings are more important, God, and more valid than, than what you tell us, God. And so that's a whole nother lesson, but uh, it's something that we need to be reminded of these little nuggets that are in all of these uh, uh, scriptures for us. And so he says, you know, go into the ark, take your family, take the animals. In verse 4 it says, for yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will, be, uh, will I destroy from off the face of of the earth. I think that would be a most interesting seven days, wouldn't it? You know, the, the, the ark is ready. You, you, God says, go in. Why did he have him go in seven days before? I have no idea. That's one of those I'm put on my list. You know, when I get to heaven, God, after I get done, you know, praising you for an eternity, I'm going to ask, why did they go in seven days before? But God had a reason. God had a purpose for them going in, uh, maybe to, to make sure they got all settled in and, and, and where they were supposed to be. Uh, we, we saw in last week where God had told him in the preparation they were to take all the food that was necessary for, for the animals, and everything was, was all stocked up and ready to go. And they, they, they says, in seven days, I'm going to make it rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and everything's uh, going to be destroyed. And then an important uh, uh, scripture here in verse 5. It says, and Noah did according unto all the, that the Lord had commanded him. You know, that, that all is an important little three-letter word in that, in that scripture, that God commanded him to do certain things at a certain time in a certain way, and he did them, okay? Um, he didn't uh, use his own um, in interpretation. He didn't use his own artistic impression on those things. God said, do this, and Noah said, okay. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know. I didn't know how to do it before you told me to do it, but because you told me to do it, I will do it. That's a, you know, a lesson that we need to learn from this is that sometimes God is going to ask us to do something that we've never done before in a way that we've never done it. Um, or, or, and we're just going to have to say, okay, God, I, I will do what you command. And, and of course, we know the consequences if he didn't was um, uh, being unsuccessful in this plan that God had for him. Um, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters was upon the earth. And it goes on, and we're not going to read through this uh, because some of it's repetitive. And not that that's a negative thing. The scriptures often use repetition for emphasis. You know, when something's repeated, it's, it means that it's important for God to, to understand. Okay? When, when you have something that, that is an instruction to somebody... Um, you know, you repeat it often. You know, look both ways before you cross the street, okay? If your child runs out in the street and gets hit by a car, you say, well, I told you three weeks ago to look both ways before you cross the street. You know, if it's important to us, we repeat it often. And, and uh, it's also because we tend to have pretty poor memory sometimes. We, we need reminded frequently. And so over the next several scriptures, he, he goes on talking about the, the two by two and, and Noah bringing into the ark, the male and the female. And, and verse 9 um, uh, uh, states that again. It says, there went in two and two and two Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. So just as God had uh, described it, after seven days, the flood waters began to come down. Um, that, that um, you know, the, the description, the rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and there's, there's another se section in here where it says the, the fountains of the deep er erupted. And so what all did that look like? There are lots of theories about what that was. It, you know, they talk about tectonic plates and, you know, the water stored in the earth. And even today that, you know, when you see a volcanic eruption, that there about 70% of, of what comes out of there is water, that there's vast stores of water within the earth someplace that, that God could... 
you know, has in reserves. Um, and we know even from the story of Job that, you know, God says, you know, where were you when I put up the storehouse of snow? You know, there's lots of things that God has and has created and has prepared with his uh, omniscience, his knowing everything about what's going to happen uh, that he has already in place and already a plan for. Uh, but the, this uh, 40 years and, and 40 nights uh, uh, of rain and um, as we go down into it, uh, uh, let's jump down uh, to verse uh, uh, 14. Um, it says, And they and every beast after their kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, and every bird of every sort, and they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein there is breath of life. And when they went in, the male and the female of all flesh, that's repeated over and over again, uh, it says, As God had commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. Uh, we talked about this a little last week, you know, in the, the, that Tennessee Ernie Ford song when he says, you know, hurry up Noah and shut the door. Well, Noah didn't shut the door. And, and that's an interesting uh, little sentence there that God shut them in. Why do you think God shut them in? I'm glad you asked. Carl? The door was really big. Yeah, that, that's a good example. You know, the, the, the door was really big, and, and, and Noah didn't have the strength to do it. I'm, I'm 600 years old. I've been working on this thing for 100 years, and, and I didn't plan to how to shut the door. That's one option. Um, I think of it because it's a lesson in the future judgment that's coming on this earth and our own human um, frailties, you might say, from a mental point of view. God is righteous. God is uh, a righteous God. God cannot tolerate sin. And God has a specific judgment that is commanded uh, and demanded based on his righteousness. Um, but we in our faultiness, in our emotional state, we are probably a little less uh, stringent than God is. Okay? Uh, if Noah was there and he had the capability of opening and closing that door as the floodwaters began to rise up and his neighbors began to drown, what would have Noah done? What would have you done in that circumstance? Well, I'm going to do everything I can. You know, well, that person wasn't as bad as the rest of them. You know, that's the person that, you know, when I ran out of gopher wood, he helped me haul some wood. So he, he deserves to, to come on the ark with me. Okay. Well, th this lady, she used to babysit Ham, Sham, and Japheth when they were, when they were young. Okay. She wasn't all bad. I'll let her on. Okay. If we were... It, you know, they, they talk about St. Saint, Saint Peter at the gate. St. Peter has nothing to do with it, just for your information. I hate to burst that bubble. God is the judge, and God is the one with the, the book of life. And if you're not in that book of life, you don't get in. Okay? If it were up to me, well, I've had a relationship with this person for a long time. I, I really enjoy their company. I'd like to spend eternity with that person. Uh, you know, yeah, they weren't perfect. Yeah, they hadn't asked Christ for forgiveness. They didn't have the blood on them, but, but they were a good person. They deserved to be in. I, I think, you know, if it were me, I think that's the reason God shut the door and shut them in. That, that Noah would have in his um, emotional uh, sensitivity to the situation, he would have let others in that God would have not been pleased with. And that, that's, uh, that's just my two cents. I think you're right. Well, good. Betty thinks I'm right. That I, I do. Oh, I think he is in charge. Absolutely. And, and, and when we try to be in charge, that's when we mess things up, isn't it? Yeah. If Noah was the decider, you know, even on the animals, well, that's an ugly animal. That's a smelly animal. I don't want that animal or this animal. You know, God brought the animals in and God uh, did all of that for us. And so that's, that's an important part of that. And so God shut him in. And then it goes on to, uh, in verse 17. It says, And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. I can only, uh, in, in this wonderful thing called an imagination that God has given us, um, and I think that serves a very valid purpose in our lives. Yeah, if, we, if we don't exercise our imagination, we get pretty bored, don't we? You know, if, we, if, if all we depend on is what we can actually see, that's, that's kind of boring. But if I can use my imagination, I can see all kinds of different things. Uh, but I can imagine what it's like when that ark 
started lifting up and, and maybe a little anxiety, you know, uh, the, 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 they're seeing these floodwaters come on and the animals are drowning, the, the people around them, it's a, it's a tragic scene. I don't think they're actually seeing that because of the way it describes the, the scripture in the scriptures later when they had to open the windows to, to let the, the birds out, that I think when God shut them in, it was completely closed in so they didn't have to, to suffer the emotional trauma of what was going around them. And that, that's, again, just, I think that uh, shows the mercifulness of God um, in, in what he would, would do for them. But, but as that boat began to float, you know, are they checking it for leaks? Are they, you know, they, they, they don't, they have no way to propel the boat. They have no way to steer the boat. They're completely dependent upon the, the grace and mercy of God um, and, and his direction uh, when they're going in there. So it began to increase, um, and it says in the waters in verse 19, um, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. That that fifteen cubits, you know, is probably twenty plus feet. That that it was covered over the highest mountain, and you know, we. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, implied in this scripture or in the, throughout the, this this uh, storyline that the earth changed during this time. You know, and so was was Mount Everest the highest mountain at that time? I don't know. Or did God, you know, in this process, was Mount Everest created later? I, I don't know exactly how that worked. Um, but it, it, does it really matter if God says I'm going to send water to cover the highest mountain? then God's going to send, he created the mountain, he can cover it if he wants to. You know, it, the fact that it seems impossible to us it doesn't mean it's impossible for God. And so uh, we, we know that, the, that every living thing was destroyed except for those that were in the ark, and the waters covered uh, the earth, and all flesh died, verse 21, all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, and every man or every person you know that's that's uh, uh we see the news today and we see tragedies and, and they are tragic when people lose their life in something like the hurricane that's happened recently or or you see you know um, uh, a mass casualty event of some sort it's it's traumatizing to us and and because we care about the humanity we care about those um uh, and do you think god did this with joy in his heart I, I, I know he didn't, you know. Uh, when we look at the character of God and the fact that he sent his only son to die for us so that we did not have to suffer spiritual death, that we could have everlasting life with him, the fact that he did that means that he cares for us and he cares for our well-being. But he's also a righteous God and he demands that we live righteously and there will be judgment if we don't. Okay? And so this is, is what's uh, 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 revealed to us in this story is God's character of righteousness and love. And, and there's no place in here where he, he took joy in what he did. It, 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 was, it was with great sadness, I think, in his heart that he had to destroy uh, what he had made. And everything died. Um, uh, and every living substance, everything was killed as we go uh, down to verse 24. It says, and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. And so it was like, well, I could tread water for, uh, you know, maybe a few days. You have people that on a life raft that might survive a week or so, but, but 150 days, that, you know, the, everything was dead, uh, and, and that was tragic. And, of course, um, um, here I think verse 8 uh, I love the way the scripture uh, uh, tells us this, uh, but we see, um, well, let's, let's um, before I do that, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. I almost skipped over that. When we talk about um, God's judgment on us, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, uh, for he that will love life and see good days, let him ref, uh, refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it or pursue it. It says, in the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. In other words, God pays attention to those that are righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers. 
You want God to hear your prayers? Follow after his commandments. Be, be righteous in his sight according to his word. It says, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The face of the Lord. Have you, uh, when, when, you, when you're disobedient and you get that look, you know that look you get when you're disobedient? You know, that's, that's the look that God gives us when we are evil, that, that he, he is against us. His, he is, uh, he's not going to help us out if we're, we're participating in evil, if we're, if we're in, in, uh, embracing the evil that's around us. God is not going to participate in that because God is righteous, and that's where his judgment comes. He is going to hear from us if we do righteous, but not if we don't. Um, and so that's, um, in verse 8, it's, it goes on with a, a, a wording that I enjoy. It says, in, uh, and God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. Uh, do you think God had forgotten about Noah? It says, oh, the, you know, it's been 150 days. I haven't had to worry about it. Everything's dead. Everything's just floating around. And God had forgotten about Noah and when it says it remembered him. Uh, no, I, I don't think that's the way the terminology is intended to, to be interpreted there. The, but when he remembered Noah, it was he, he brought a favor on Noah, that, that he recognized Noah's obedience, he recognized Noah's righteousness, and he, he validated that relationship that he and Noah had uh, before the flood, during the construction process and during the flood, that in all of those times, Noah continued to maintain his righteous relationship with God, and God was going to honor that when it says he remembered uh, them. It's like when we do something in remembrance, when we do the, the Lord's Supper, and we do that in remembrance of him. It's not that we forgot about the Lord, but it's just that, that, that thing that, that brings it to the front of mind and just... just uh, in, uh, uh, makes us focus on that. So God uh, brought all those things back. He says, and God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The waters began to dissipate. The waters were drying up. God was affecting it um, and, in what he was doing. And the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. And so that fountains of the deep, whether those were geysers or earthquake and eruptions or, you know, whatever that was, whatever that looked like, whatever God created to, to affect that in, in that tragic moment, those stopped and God began to calm things and God was uh, correcting that, that uh, uh, danger that was there. And the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated and the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventh day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And so that's, uh, uh, you know, again, evidence where it was a specific time, a specific date. I can just imagine, you know, Noah had his little calendar in the ark, you know, scratching off the days. You know, how many days was it? Uh, and it came to rest. And, and that, again, that, that constant motion of the ark on the waters and all of a sudden stops. You know, and, and it's been 150 days. It's, that's been almost, a, it was, plus the 40 days that it had rained, you know, that was, that was a half a year or more that they were on that boat. Uh, I've never been on a boat that long. I've been on boats for a few hours at a time. And the, even after you get off of that, you're still, you're still walking and, and a little bit wobbly. Uh, at least I do. Okay? But after months and months and months on the boat, when it finally stops, there, that would have been... Uh, very comforting to them to say, uh, we're finally on solid ground. But on the other hand, they have no idea where they are. Okay? They, they, God has moved them around. Uh, they, they don't know where they are. They're no, they don't know what they're going to do. It says, um, uh, the uh, waters decreased. Um, and let's see here, um, verse 6. And it says, and it came to pass at the end of 40 days after they uh, came to rest on the mountain that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters, uh, uh, until the waters were dried up from off the earth. The raven, uh, I, I don't know why exactly, but one of the commentaries uh, mentioned that a raven is a, a, a scavenger. Okay? And after all this death and destruction, there would be, you know, if the waters abated uh, and exposed some of those uh, carcasses that were there, the raven would have had food to eat. So the raven had no purpose in coming back 
uh, to the ark. Or that was, it was one thought they had. And so after 40 days, Noah lets this uh, raven go, and it doesn't uh, come back. It says, and he also sent forth a dove from him uh, to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. It says, but the dove didn't find any place to rest. The dove is, is a, a seed eater. The dove eats, eats uh, the produce from the, the ground, from the plants. It didn't find anything to eat. So, yes, the waters had abated, but there was nothing productive in there yet. So they were still dependent on the food source that God had had them uh, store up. And so it, we know the story. He sent uh, the dove out again, um, and it plucked off an olive leaf and, and brought it back. And it says, and so uh, no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So the, the earth was beginning to regenerate life, that God had a plan, and God's plan uh, was, was coming to pass here. Um, and he stayed yet another seven days, and he sent forth a dove, and it returned uh, not again. And it goes on to describe how uh, long they had been there and what the time frame was. Um, and then in verse 15, can you imagine how antsy Noah and his family were to get out of there? You know, I've been, I've, I've been uh, you know, cooped up with these elephants and, and, and these other various animals and feeding them and caring for them. Those animals didn't take care of themselves, I don't think. I think Noah and his family were, were tending to those animals, and, and it was tedious. And they were ready to get out. You know, the, 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 they finally were able to open the windows and let a little fresh air in. Um, but it, uh, I would have been, again, the, the reason that God shut them in is that they would have probably got out earlier than God wanted them to. But in verse 15, it says, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that was with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Um, you know, as it, uh, if, if you add up all the time that Noah was in the ark, it was over a year, okay? Uh, now, in that time frame, it's interesting, you know, that ark had a limited capacity, um, you know, we mentioned rabbits last week. You know, if you have a, a pair of rabbits on that boat, in a year you're going to have lots of rabbits, okay? If you've got uh, all these animals, you know, in those confined spaces, uh, you've got, you know, uh, the, the three sons and their wives in this confined space for over a year. Why, why weren't there any children born? Why weren't there any offspring? It's interesting that, that, that God, in his wisdom, um, did not allow reproduction during that time until after they got off the ark. I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, it's, uh, uh, that, that uh, is the only thing I can read here. He didn't tell them to re reproduce until after they got out of the ark there in chapter 17. Um, and so um, in verse 18 it says, And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him and all the beasts, and they went forth out of the ark. And we're going to pick that up next week when we start talking about the end uh, or what the, the result of this was. Um, it, wouldn't it be nice if you clean off the whole, start with a fresh slate, now everything's going to be perfect. Well, we know that's not the case. But God exhibited his judgment on the earth at this time. Uh, it shows us what God's character is and that God will uh, have that um, uh, determination to, to bring judgment and righteousness to this earth and that the time of, of evil will have its time of punishment and there will be death that comes from that uh, unrighteousness. So how do we um, live in this world uh, in the, as if it were in the time of Noah? What is our responsibility? Our responsibility is to prepare our families the way Noah prepared his family, to, to be able to be rescued in that time of judgment. Our, our goal is, is, I know it tells in the scriptures that Noah was a preacher, that Noah went, you know, it, when people ask him, why are you building that boat? Judgment's coming. You need to get right with God. That is our responsibility. Uh, but most importantly is we need a relationship with God. In, in John chapter 15, verse 4, 
Jesus is speaking, he says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abideth in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. That we in our daily walk have to have that relationship with God as Noah did, that we abide. That abide is not just an occasional thing. You know, you can't, if you had a, a, a branch and you said, okay, today, branch, you're going you're gonna to be inserted into the tree trunk. You know, this is your day. Get all the nutrients you can. Uh, that, that tree and that branch have to be intertwined permanently. Okay? That's the only way it can be, uh, sur survive and be fruitful in what it's doing. And so that, that example for us in our daily walk with God is that we have to be in, abiding in him every day. And that we need to be uh, following after his righteousness, be obedient. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? Not at all. Was Noah perfect? Not at all. We'll find that uh, later in the lesson, that, that Noah was not a perfect man, but Noah was obedient. Uh, and that is the, the best place to start. God can, if, if you're obedient, God can work with you from that. He is merciful, um, but, but he demands obedience and righteousness from us. And so that's what I wanted to pick.